Thanks, thanks, thanks. Nice to see you. Are you happy? Yeah? You know, I, I, I sat back here just crying during a, a lot of what was going on because I could feel the significance of the heart of God for this, uh, for this time, this season, this event. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to these, these few days together. Um, but before we, I guess you're still passing buckets. Awesome. Good. Uh, well, thank you. I love you too. That's, maybe before it's over, we can have a big group hug, all of us. And just make sure nobody gets injured, you know. A pastor had dinner at the home of a couple in his church. After he left, the wife said to the husband, I think he stole our spoon. This bothered her for a whole year. A year later, the couple had the pastor over for dinner again. Unable to resist, the wife asked, did you steal our spoon last year? The pastor replied, no, I put it inside your Bible. That was, that was brutal. That was brutal. <clears throat> it's a privilege to gather like we are in this particular place, Southern California, Los Angeles. It's one of the greatest honors ever. There are very few places in the world that have as significant a revival history as this part of the world. The Lord pays attention to the cries, the prayers, the lives that were poured out 30 years ago, 40, 100 years ago in this area to make a mark in the earth. Something tragically happened, and that's the move of God that was released here was not sustained. And any time the house is clean and swept and it's not occupied, the enemy that was driven from the place comes back seven times worse. And today, in the place of the spirit of revelation stands a spirit of insanity that is now being embraced as the message of truth. And it grows in the absence of a yes from a sold out people. And I believe the Lord has brought us together because we share a conviction in our heart for what we want God to do. I'm so thankful that Jesus is returning. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me, but the hope of the world is not the return of Christ. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel, unadulterated, declared from a people that are unafraid of consequences. It's truth and it changes a life. Without power, it is not good news. It's not a philosophy. It's not a group that we join because we agree philosophically. It is something we become a part of because the actual spirit that raised Jesus from the dead took up residence in us and did so with a purpose of demonstrating the power of resurrection as we confront the impossibilities of life. This is the assignment of every believer. You and I were created. We were created with an appetite to see the impossibilities of life bend their knee at the name Jesus through our lips. It is in the DNA of every believer. It's in the DNA of every believer. It is what we were born for. We know it instinctively. It has to get taught out of us or disappointed out of us. Remove the lies, deal with the disappointment, and you find out why you're alive. We're alive to confront those things that have brought brokenness and devastation to the lives of people all around us. And we are alive for such a time as this. I want to read a portion of Scripture out of Matthew 12. I don't know how many of you bring your Bibles to events like this, but I love my Bible. This is Jesus in print. Say this with me. I love my Bible. Okay, you can stay. 
people say, well, I just, I just don't remember what I read. Yeah, I don't remember what I had for breakfast last Friday either, but it still nourished me. <laughs> truth is truth. Well, I fall asleep when I pray. I never got angry with my kids when they fell asleep in my arms. The very thing the enemy uses to drive us from what we were born for is the very thing he delights in. All right, well, that went over pretty well. Let's get moving here. I'm in Matthew chapter 12. If you have your Bible or your iPads or phones or whatever, I still want someone to create an app that when you open the Bible, there is the sound of turning pages because I miss that sound. I'm reading, I'm going to read several verses out of Matthew chapter 12. I'll start with verse 9. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. Behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. They asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Jump down to verse 12. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Verse 14, Pharisees want to kill him. Verse 15, when Jesus knew that, he withdrew from there, and a great multitude followed him. Look at the phrase, and he healed them all. Verse 22, then one was brought to him, then one was brought to him, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. It's frightening when religious people can be unmoved by the demonstration of God's power that brings a redemptive touch to the broken condition of man. Every demonstration of power, whether it was walking on water, whether it was stilling a storm, raising the dead, healing a blind man, <clears throat> excuse me, every demonstration of power was a redemptive touch to restore something that was broken in people. And the group of religious leaders that are in this particular audience that ask for a sign are asking for something that will convince them who Jesus is, something like parting of the Red Sea, water coming out of a rock. They're looking for something to be impressed by that puts them into a position of control. And because they are unmoved by compassion for the broken condition of humanity that is being healed through the life of Jesus, they are disqualified to function in that same anointing and power because he was moved by compassion and brought healing and brought deliverance. In this passage, <clears throat> says they looked for a sign and Jesus gave them a response. He said, the evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. That has been used to cause fear in the people of God to pursue a miraculous demonstration of the gospel. It's a horrible interpretation of Scripture to come to that conclusion because he said it in the context of healing and deliverance. He's confronting a mindset that needs to be impressed by power instead of being impressed by compassion, instead of being impressed by what God is doing to bring the redemptive solution into broken situations. He's confronting a mindset that can live willing to break the Sabbath to take care of an animal, but unwilling to break the Sabbath to bring deliverance and healing to a human. The animal represented, represents financial gain. It is their business world, and they'll break the law for profit, but they won't to touch people. Jesus is confronting them where it hurts the most, 
And he says it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. This is in the middle of him demonstrating power. This is in the middle of him touching people that are broken, healing the broken hearts, doing all the stuff that he did. In the middle of that, he confronts this mindset. It's not the mindset of the disciple that seeks to demonstrate the love and power of God. You and I have an obligation. We live with a certain sense of indebtedness, I believe, to this world. We have a certain sense of indebtedness. I owe people a lifestyle of purity, and I owe them a lifestyle of power. I'm obligated to live in such a way that this gospel, this authentic gospel, will do what Jesus said it will do. No excuses. No excuses. I do not want to create a theology that makes it safe for unbelief to dwell in me. Those, those safe places for unbelief must be exposed because God is trying to bring us to a place where we accurately represent who this Jesus is. He is the resurrected one. He's the same today as he was yesterday. Jesus gave the great commission and he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple nations. And then he said, teach those disciples of yours, teach them what I taught you. What did Jesus teach them? Look at Matthew 10. Go, and as you go, say, the kingdom of God is at hand. Then heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse lepers. He taught them how to demonstrate the power of God. Healing is not the whole gospel, but neither is the gospel whole without it. An absolute essential part of the gospel is the deliverance of torment and the healing of disease. It's the healing, the broken condition of man. And each one of us who have confessed Christ as our Lord have that sense of obligation, of indebtedness. Get alone with God until he touches your heart. Take risk in public and let's see what he'll do. When it happens, he gets all the credit. If it doesn't happen, get back into the secret place and cry out to God until there's a breakthrough. I, I have interesting conversations with people. One of them is, well, Bill, we shouldn't follow after signs. Signs are supposed to follow us. That's true. The Bible teaches that. But if signs don't follow you, follow them till they follow you. <laughs> Hang around the miracle atmosphere until it gets on you, till it affects how you think, till it affects how you pray, till it affects what, you, what we anticipate. Together, there must be this appetite. Pastor friend of mine, years ago, I didn't know him well, but he gave this story that really rocked me. <clears throat> he, uh, he, he was a pastor, and their church was growing, and they wanted to build a new sanctuary, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and so they hired the contractor, and they're in the process of building this beautiful new building that will accommodate this very, very growing church. And he, he wasn't a builder. He didn't know anything about building, but he wanted so bad to help. And so he'd come to the contractor day after day. Is there anything I can do to help? And, you know, you can just see he's just wanting to do anything to get his hands dirty and, and be, be involved in the process. And finally, one day the contractor, I don't know if he got fed up or what, but he, he made something up. He just basically said, listen, and I don't remember the exact number, but he, he said something like, um, I need 100 two-by-fours cut to eight foot in length by tomorrow morning. Well, this pastor was just as excited as could be. So he, after, after everybody, the crew had left, he got out there and he grabbed all the wood and he, and he took his tape measure and he measured eight feet. He marked with a pencil. He cut that board. And then he put his tape measure away and he took the board he just cut and he put it on top of the next board, evened it up perfectly, marked it with a pencil, cut it. And then he took the old board, put it in a pile, and the newly cut board he put on top of the next one that was to be cut, marked it off evenly, and cut it. He did this for 100 boards. Every time you do that, the second board is about an eighth of an inch longer than the previous one, which is not a big deal if you're cutting three or four boards. But when you're cutting 100, you end up with boards that are nine feet long and some that are eight feet, and there's everything in between. And as long as we compare ourselves with previous generations, we look good. 
But when we compare ourselves to the original standard of the gospel, we realize we need to get along with God and find out why there's not the demonstration of the authentic gospel of purity and power. This is a summons. This is a summons. It's a draft notice. It's a draft notice that we have been called by the Lord to represent him well. The simplicity of devotion to Christ. Absolute, undistracted simplicity of devotion to Jesus. It's why I'm alive. It's why I'm alive. It's why we live, is the simplicity of devotion. Jesus, in confronting this group of leaders, he went on to say, an evil, adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. And then he said, as Jonah was three days, three nights in the belly of a great fish, son of man will be three days, three nights in the earth. Listen to this verse. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The next verse, the queen of Sheba, excuse me, the queen of the south, which is the queen of Sheba, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. What does the story of Nineveh represent? It represents the bold preaching of the gospel. One man through one message brought an entire city and a region to their knees in repentance in absolute surrender to God. Power is first displayed in the boldness, the bold decree of the gospel. I believe in the miracles. I believe in the deliverance. All that stuff is essential, but they are all responses from heaven to the bold decree of who Jesus is. Scripture says in Acts 4, 29, God, take note of their threats. Peter's praying. Take note of their threats. Grant that your bondservants can speak your word with all boldness and signs and wonders. And then you extend your hand and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Listen to the sequence. Give us all boldness and in response to the boldness, extend your hand to do the miracles that are needed to verify that Jesus is truly raised from the dead. Every miracle testifies of the resurrection. Every miracle testifies that Jesus has defeated death. Every miracle. And it's been tragic that throughout church history, miracles tend to get put into this little corner called our corporate gatherings. And I love them. I love them more than, than, than you could possibly imagine. But my greatest delight is to hear of them on the streets, in the marketplace, in the, in the, in the workplace, at the office, in the schools, at the playground, all these places where you and I get to bring Jesus and his authentic nature to heal the brokenhearted, his authentic heart to restore those things that have been damaged and destroyed by sin. We know that John the Baptist, according to Jesus' commentary on him in Matthew 11, we know that John the Baptist was the greatest of all Old Testament prophets. It says that John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah was a miracle-working prophet, and yet we have no record of any miracles from John the Baptist. And yet it says he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. To me, this only goes to prove the point that walking in power, John the Baptist was known for the bold decree of the gospel, the bold preaching of truth. And as Jonah demonstrated the power of God in the bold confession of faith, an entire city turned to God. Boldness. The Spirit of God is attracted to bold confession of faith. Great faith does not grow through great striving. Great faith comes in response to great surrender. It is yieldedness that gives place to the demonstration of faith because faith is God's own heart expressed through a surrendered believer. In this story, we have Jonah and the bold preaching. That's power. But the next story 
he says, the queen of the south will rise up and condemn that generation. Why? Because she traveled from one end of the known earth to the other end to sit at the feet of Solomon. Think about this. What does it take for royalty, a king, a queen in this case, to leave their place where everything in their kingdom is created around their, their pleasure, their survival, the longevity of their family line? Everything is created around them. What does it take for someone in that position to leave their throne and go sit at the feet of another king? It's because God has put, especially in leaders, he has put an appetite for wisdom that they don't always know how to identify, but they'll do anything to get it. And so we have a queen that is worshiped in some measure by her constituents. And she takes this wealth as she comes and she spends time sitting at the feet of this King Solomon. And her conclusion was, it wasn't an exaggeration. Your wisdom is greater than I could have possibly imagined. He answered not, over, not only the questions that she brought, but he solved so many things in her own heart, her own perception on reality, her own perception on life. She was overwhelmed by this wisdom. Do you think that's the only time God wants to display this kind of wisdom? Jesus brings to the surface two subjects in this story. First is the demonstration of power. The second is the demonstration of wisdom. Why? Because in the Bible, Old Testament, Exodus 32, Bezalel was filled with the Spirit of God. And when he was filled with the Spirit of God, it was manifest through wisdom. Acts chapter 2, they are filled with the Spirit of God, and it was manifest through power. One truth was never meant to replace the previous. They were supposed to work in tandem. They were supposed to work in tandem because bring, wisdom brings the mind of Christ into a practical context where it helps people to know how to live, how to reign in life, how to raise children, how to function in business, how to create, how to imagine, how to work with God to display His wonders in the earth through their own creative gift, wisdom. And then there's power. And those two were so always meant to work hand in hand. In fact, just one chapter later, there's this statement. It says in 1354, it says, He taught them in their synagogue so that when they were astonished, they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? It's the two things in tandem. We have this opportunity. We have a world that is aching for solutions. We have a world that is aching for some of the solutions, it's, it's cancer. For others, it's, it's economic crisis. It's all kinds of things. How do we get a generation to be free of addiction and all these kinds of things? They're looking for answers. And you and I have access to the secret places of God, the secret things of God where He's already announced to us it is His good pleasure to give us the mysteries of the kingdom of God. It's already written in your inheritance. You sat in the lawyer's room and he read off what you got. And part of what you got are the secrets of God. Now we have to learn how to make the withdrawal. Because there's a lot of people that boast to me about what they have, but they can't display it. There's a difference between what's in my account and what's in my possession. It is true. Jesus set us up to manifest and display him in such a way that the, the people of the earth look in awe. And they don't glorify you and me. It's not about that. It's about, he says, let your works, your light shine before me in, in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The entire ambition of Scripture is to get the people of God to accurately represent who he is, to represent Jesus. Represent Jesus. Jesus. This is the invitation for every single believer. Every person has a unique expression. You look at the four Gospels, they are all unique under themselves, and yet they are each accurately represent who this Jesus is. These four men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they were unique in their perspective, but they were consistent with that authentic testimony of who Jesus is. Every person in this room is created with a unique gift, a unique perspective 
a, unique, a uniqueness about how you live and how you think that brings just color and, and, and brilliance and beauty to this representation of who Jesus is. But it must be pure and it must have power. And we're never allowed to choose one over the other. That's, I taught a class once. A young man in the class said, I will pursue demonstrating the gifts of the Spirit when the character of Christ is more established in my life. Sounds good. So I asked him, who gave you the right to decide when you're going to obey God? He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse lepers. Do we actually think we can develop the character of Christ by ignoring what he told us to do? I, I said it very kindly, of course. <laughs> Wore smiling and everything. I feel much more intense tonight than I have felt in a long time. Because I can, I can see the heart of God over this part of the land. This, I went to high school in L.A. I, uh, I, I spent a, a, a lot of good years here learning how to drive. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> let's, let's start the prayer chain right now for everyone who's learning how to drive down here. I have a huge part of my history, my life here. I read the stories of Azusa Street, of Calvary Chapel. I read the stories of the charismatic renewal. I read the stories of Billy Graham, of the Lord launched him into a place of prominent influence in righteousness, and it happened here in Los Angeles. You look through the stories, and you can see where these people, they poured out their lives on this land. And the blood of the saints, if you will, cries out to God to this day, oh God, restore us as a place of revival. Restore us as a place of outpouring. Restore us as a people of the Spirit, a people who will do anything you say to do. People quote to me, Matthew 7, I'm sure they mean to encourage me with it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. And then they quote the next verse. Did we not do wonders in your name? And he said, depart from me, I never knew you. It tells us a couple things. One, there's one thing more important than knowing God. That's him knowing you. He only knows me to the measure I open myself to him. It's one thing to know the facts about a person, the number of hairs on my head, but it's another to become intimately acquainted. We worship tonight wonderfully and it's beautiful. Scripture says we're to worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit means with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. In truth means nothing's hidden. We come before him, nothing's hidden. All the success, all the failure, everything. It's all open as we worship. But the other thing that that verse tells me, <clears throat> did we not do wonders in your name? Said, Depart from me, I never knew you. If those without a relationship with Jesus can do miracles in his name, then those who know him are without excuse. The Spirit of God is in us, and he wants out. The Scripture says he is in us as a river. He's not a lake. He's not a nice pond that we sit on a raft and float in. He is a force that alters the geography around us every time we cooperate with what he's doing and with what he is saying. 
This Spirit of God longs to reveal who Jesus is, and He longs to do it through a people who have said yes. Now I already know I preach to the choir in many ways right now because you've said yes, and you're here at this event. But I, I feel so disturbed in a right way, I think, I hope. Maybe I'm disturbed other ways too, but <laughs> I feel very provoked in the sense that the name of this event, Heaven Come, is actually more ordained by God than we thought was possible. For in Scripture, He taught us to pray. In every commission you can find in Scripture, the Great Commission, go into all the world, Matthew 10, heal the sick, raise the dead, every commission is all summed up into one greater commission. He said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm told that that can actually be translated something like this. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God, be done. It's already been decided there. He's just looking for a partnership here. It's just the co-laboring role. It's what he looks for here. It's already been settled. The price has been paid. The context has been paid. He has set us with the assignment to restore what's been broken. And you are put into a place already knowing the heart of God. And we have the privilege to say, kingdom of God, realm of God's dominion, come. Will of God that is seen so beautifully and perfectly in heaven, let it be done here in the same way. Come. Heaven come is the cry of God, and I pray it becomes the cry of this group right here. I'm here for an upgrade. I'm, I'm, I, I love the chance to speak, but I'm here for the entire event, because I believe, except for the last meeting, because I have to fly home for Sunday morning. But the, the point is, uh, I'm here because I am so hungry for an upgrade. I'm so hungry for that place. It must become more authentic. It must be de demonstrated more clearly. It must be pro uh, proclaimed more accurately. Everything about it must be refined and focused to have the fullest sense of impact because God is not into entertaining us, smiling our way into heaven. We are transformers, reformers that have been assigned to take a me message of resurrection power and come into the hellish, deathful situations of life and begin to prophesy the nature of Jesus, begin to prophesy the heart of God into broken situations. So, so I want to pray. Let's come to that. I want to pray. I don't know what anyone else in this event is going to speak on, but I have this sense that the Lord is going to be layering line upon line, precept on precept. He's going to be adding perspective after another perspective after another perspective not just for our comfort. He is the great comforter. But I discovered something. The Holy Spirit is my comforter. And he leads me into uncomfortable situations, so I'll need him. <laughs> he does not seem to mind my discomfort. Thanks for coming to this. Thanks for saying yes. But I'm going to ask you to upgrade your yes. Why don't you stand? With me? <clears throat> I
I upgrade my yes to my wife every day. It's kind of funny to hear, hear people say you can't fear God and have an intimate relationship with him because there's no intimacy and fear. I figure whoever made that up is obviously not married. Because my wife scares me. <laughs> and I love her. And I up my yes to her many times a day. I, I, I'm sincere. Many times a day. I'll just tell her, honey, I love you. I wake up in the night with that for the Father. Oh, Father, I love you. I wake, I wake up, I go to sleep with that embrace. I go to wake up in the morning with that embrace. It's just, it's just something that seems to be initiated by God himself. My heart just burns. It burns with affection for him. And I, I feel like this burning affection for God himself is about to direct our lives. It will not be a small fire that we control for our benefit but it's something that we yield to as we find God launches us into realms of breakthrough that we never thought was possible. Yeah. Never thought was possible. Yeah. We've seen things happen in this last year that are absolutely off the charts, off the charts. And I've got this sense that God is about to multiply the effectiveness of the gospel through the lips of the people in this room. Multiply, multiply. Things that were a dream to me. In fact, almost ridiculous dream to me 20 years ago has become normal. Some things that were too big to even dream 10 years ago are now normal. We've not yet begun to scratch the surface. He said, beyond all you could ask or think. This is what he said. This is his promise. He, he said, greater works than these shall you do. He said, beyond all we could ask or think. All, ask is my prayer life. Think is my imagination. He says, I want to function in your life beyond the reach of your greatest prayer and beyond the reach of your wildest dream. That's where I want to function. But he's ended it with this phrase, according to the power that works within you. There has to be a yes here for him to manifest there. I don't know if it's comfortable for you to hold hands, but I've already made you uncomfortable, so you might as well hold hands. <laughs> if you don't know the person next to you, that's not my fault. You've been with them for two hours. <laughs> I want us to pray. I feel like this is a corporate thing. I, I know there's an individual yes to God. I, I've been, I've been in that mode all day long, as I was yesterday and the day before, and the day before, in that mode of just the personal yes. Yes, God, anything, 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 anything. But I also feel like there's this voice that is to erupt from this part of the world, this part of the nation. I realize we have people from all over, all over the country. I get that. But right now, even if you're from another nation, I want you to pray as though you lived here and we ask God to heal our land. Heal our land. We need, we need that which is beyond the really reach of any political group. We need something that is beyond the reach of any social service. We need something so significant to happen in our land, in our state, that only God could pull this off. Only God can pull it off. And I want you to pray prayers of humility and request for yourself, for the people you hold hands with, and for this nation.
lift your voices, please. Do not pray timidly. Save that for Starbucks. Right now we pray. Right now we pray with force. Lift your voices. Let's pray together. Grab that handle. Let's pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Don't stop. Don't stop. Ask the Lord to use that person on your right and left, to use them in a significant way beyond what they have ever thought was possible. Now put your hands on your own heart. Continue to pray with the same passion. Pray for the person who really needs it right now. Lift your voices. Don't, don't cut it back. In fact, let's intensify the prayer. God, start right here. Increase the fire in my soul. Increase the fire in my soul. No excuses. No excuses. Increase the fire in my own heart the fire of passion. Now I want to pray over you. Father, we've come because we are hungry. There's already been a yes of our hearts, a yes to you, a place of surrender. But Father, I'm asking, amplify our yes. Increase it so deeply in us. Cause us to be an unsettled people, unsettled with anything that is inferior to your purpose and your plan for our life. Anything that is inferior. Father, I'm asking that you would invade our dream life, invade our night seasons, invade our night season, deposit things in us that we would, be, we would find too difficult to listen to and receive during the day, that you would lock up instruction in us. Give us vision for the days to come. Give us irreversible hope for your purpose and plan for our cities and our nation. Give us wisdom and understanding to display great power of this resurrected Christ. And let us see cities and nations come to you. God, we repeat your word to you. You said nations would come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Nations would come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Father, I ask that you'd heal this city and that you'd restore California. Restore California through the mind of Christ. Restore California with the purity of Jesus. No defilement, no compromise. Restore California with an authentic display of the redemptive touch of Jesus 
the redemptive power of God. I pray for all of this. In Jesus' name.